It might be as simple as getting back to basics. What were you doing before that as you got more successful, you stopped doing? And how do you bring yourself back to an energy of excitement around those basic things? So don't don't lose hope. Instead, focus on going back and just, just grinding out the things that got you excited that you were building to begin with. <laughs>the management and transparency is what's very important. So once you submit a referral, you're going to have your own home advantage account and it's going to tell you where everything sits. So if you have 10 referrals that you've sent into the network, it's going to give you all 10 referrals. It's going to tell you every milestone that that client is sitting in, whether they're touring homes, whether they're in escrow. And you now can manage through the home advantage application as far as what your pipeline looks like for the referrals that you've sent. And so it's pretty sophisticated uh, and it's, it's all click of a button, guys. I think we're live. It's a good thing, huh? We were just so busy talking about this case that you just were sharing your thoughts about with me that we almost missed coming to talk to you guys. Uh, so Saul, do you want to share with everybody what we were just kind of talking about behind the scenes? Yeah, we were talking about first this overreaching idea of antitrust in real estate. But then to bring it down to reality, that's what kind of always going on. But to bring it into reality, there's a case that's uh, just been, uh, it was certified in February of last year for uh, class action. And it's a case against MLSs, the National Association of Realtors, the big name real estate companies, franchises. And the case, it challenges the way an MLS works. And basically the MLS works based on something called a buyer offer of compensation. And the reason you get paid typically in real estate, if you represent a buyer, is not because you got a contract with a buyer, but because you're a member of the MLS. And so this rule in the MLS offers a blanket offer of compensation to people who bring in a buyer. And so that's the way the industry works. And some people use buyer broker contracts, but many do not. And so what this case is saying is that that offer of compensation really is a conspiracy to fix commissions and that sellers shouldn't have to pay the buyer side commission. Mm. People in the industry would say, well, it's ridiculous. This is how it works. This is an NAR would say, right? There's really good reasons for the way it's set up this way. But this case was proved for uh, class action status and damages are in the multi-billion dollar range. So they're not something to scoff at. Right. Right. And so when we were talking, Carrie, what this really brings out is that people have been fighting buyer broker contracts for a long time. But if, in fact, you can't get compensated through a cooperating broker who takes a listing, how would you get compensated if you represented buyers? And the answer would probably be through a buyer broker agreement. Yeah, actually explaining your value and having someone want to hire you and being willing to pay for your service. So what do you think if you were to hypothesize, let's, let's imagine that the case went the way that we're all hoping it doesn't. And we were in a situation where, wh how do you imagine that playing out for agents? For, for an agent today, I think that they could be in jeopardy of doing real estate the way they do without a buyer broker contract, mm -hmm. right? So I think that this is the time for agents to start to seriously look at integrating using buyer broker contracts into their business. And I think if they do that, it, they'll, they'll minimize or mitigate any future liabilities. Absolutely. Do you guys want one tip on how I get people comfortable with buyer broker agreements? I love it. Okay, well, actually I'll give you two. Two okay. tips. So number one, you never ask them to sign a piece of paper until you ask them the question, do you feel confident I'm the right agent to support you throughout the process, right? Throughout you buying a home. Because people often couple asking for commitment and getting the agreement signed and people get afraid of paperwork. And so you really want to isolate any concern that they have before you ask them to sign a piece of paper. So you know, is it that they don't think I'm the right person 
or is it they're just not comfortable with the agreement? The second is super tactical and simple. Don't call it a contract. We call it a loyalty agreement, okay? A loyalty agreement is warm. It makes people say, well, I'm loyal. It's almost as though if they say, no, I don't want to sign on a loyalty agreement. And I don't want to be loyal. I don't want to be loyal to you, Carrie. It's like, really? Oh my gosh, I'm so surprised to hear that. Why? They're like, uh, uh, they don't know what to do. They get uncomfortable, right? And what I observe from agents is that often they get uncomfortable asking for commitment. Yeah, right? absolutely. I have one more tip. Go. Oh. Okay. So the last one is um, when you ask for them to sign, right? And you say, you know, okay, this is our loyalty agreement. If they push back, most of the time, they're really afraid of commitment. And so, you, of course, you want to isolate their concern. But one way that we overcome it, we make it so those agreements can be canceled at any time. They're day-to-day -day agreements. And I write it right there under other terms. And I do that because I find that it's not that I'm going to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the buyer. That's the truth. I'm not going to go to court over it. That's not my intention. But what I want to avoid is taking the commitment to be in partnership and work together lightly. And so most of the time, if they sign the agreement with you, you have their promise and commitment to work with you. So people will say, oh, I would never work with a buyer that, you know, there's an out clause. I'm like, well, wait a minute. Why not? If they fire you, you're still fired, right? So yeah. why not utilize that? hey, I'm going to earn your business every single day. And it says so right here in our loyalty agreement. Why not earn that to get extra people feeling confident hiring you and signing off on that and getting their firm commitment? No, I think that makes a lot of sense. And so one of the reasons that agents are reluctant to ask for, at least in my mind, is, and what I've seen over the years, is that they'll say, well, other agents, they, they believe this in their head that the, the buyer would say no because other agents aren't asking for it, right? Mm -hmm. So they're afraid, agents, many, they're afraid to ask for it because they think that what they're gonna hear from the buyer is nobody else is asking me to sign this document. Oh, I love it when they say that to me. Sure, it gives you, a, you could turn the tables on them, right? Oh my heavens, what agents are you talking to that are willing to work without any commitment? They just must be spread so thin that their results, they're probably not finding off markets for their clients. They're probably, you start walking through what you do and you, you simply say, my goodness, if I were to work with everybody that wants to work with me without really solidifying who wants to be in partnership to find a home with me, I wouldn't be able to take good care of anyone. Yeah, this is a great differentiator. This is how I differentiate myself from everybody else because you see what you're going to get from me is loyalty as well. I'm going to be your exclusive representative. Just like a seller has an exclusive agent, you're going to have an exclusive agent. And this is, isn't that more professional to be able to do this this way? And so you can turn the tables on that fear. It's really a, an unfounded or an imaginary fear. That the well, and the other agents just don't have as much experience, offer as much value. And so maybe they're not comfortable asking, but I can tell you with certainty, I'm very comfortable asking. And all of the clients that I work with 100% agree to be working in an exclusive relationship with me. And I offer that cancellation guarantee. So if there's ever a concern, they're never trapped. I'm running their business every day, but I want to know that we're working together because I spend time and money, Saul, on your behalf before you ever buy a home. I'm investing all of that up front because I know that we're committed to working together. Does well, that sound fair? People right. will not say no to you. They will not. I think I shared this on one of the, the uh, webinars that we did in the past. When I got started, I came from a new construction background. And so the idea that I could find the buyer, whatever they wanted, was so exciting to me. I was usually trapped um, in a trailer in the middle of a field with a generator. And if nobody came into my model that day, I was so lonely. I was so excited when they got there. And so when I got in the, the resale business, 
I had seen all these agents that wasted so much time. They didn't qualify buyers. They would just bring them into my model without qualifying them. And so one of the things that I did that was different, not only did I require them to sign off on a loyalty agreement, I also charged them a retainer fee for my time of $495 up front. Okay. We used to, we used to do that. We, I actually charged. I actually gave people a choice of how I could be compensated in a transaction. And one of them was hourly. Uh -huh. I'd, give, I'd give them the choice and I would take a retainer and it was an offer. And very few people took me up on it because they didn't want to pay hourly. And, so, and I would explain, would give me an opportunity to explain, this is the way it typically works in real estate. The seller pays, the commission comes through the seller. I earn this much money now. If in fact, you don't want to do it that way. I can arrange this so that the money gets credited back to you, but you just pay me by the hour for all the time that I spend. And if we don't buy, if you don't buy anything, then I still get compensated. And only probably a handful of times did somebody opt for the hourly compensation and the retainer. They preferred to do it the other way. Right? That's what I would opt for. That actually, I just arranged for that when I bought a home in Florida because I said, what do you think your hourly rate is to the agent? And whatever his answer was, let's say $50, $100, whatever it was. And I said, well, how about this? How about if I pay you double, but then I want to negotiate for myself because this is what I do yeah. for myself in Virginia. And he thought that was a great deal. And so did I. So it all depends on how you think. I love your creative thinking about offering options because when you did that, people go, he's putting me in control. I'm getting to decide how I want to do it. And then they hired you the way you wanted, which was to give you the full commission and probably the retainer anyway. Yep. So it works out. really, really well. Well, here's a um, question for you. And that yeah. is, when do you present this to the buyer? At what point in your relationship with the buyer you ask them to sign that loyalty agreement. Always in the first meeting. First meeting. The only time, there's two times that I won't do, actually three. Okay, I'll tell you three different scenarios where I wouldn't do that. Um, if I were doing a showing appointment and I didn't have the opportunity to sit down and do a full needs analysis, we have three steps in our process. One is the needs analysis. The second is what we call our buyer process. It's our buyer presentation. And we walk them through all of the steps when they're buying a home. Then right after we get them excited and comfortable, that's when we talk about our loyalty agreement. Right after they sign off on the loyalty agreement, we do a process that we call the reality check analysis. And if you guys have never heard me talk about this, oh my gosh, it's such a game changer. It'll, it'll change your life permanently. And it's very simple, very simple. All you do is before you switch to looking at active properties for your client, you only focus on the last 90 days of sold properties. When you identify three properties that the seller would have bought, then you know you've succeeded at, at helping to shape the client into a realistic client. But if you see that nothing sold based on their criteria and price range in the last 90 days, then you know you have some work to do. And it's time to reset their expectations. Is it the price that they're willing to be flexible on? Would they rather look at a different location? Do they want to change some of the features? What is it that they want to shift so that there is realistic options that have sold recently that they would have bought? And when you do that on the third step, the amount of people that ghost you go down dramatically because people ghost you and they feel like you didn't listen, right? And when you don't get realistic expectations, then you go to find an active property to show them. And what happens? You can't find one because one doesn't exist, right? And I would say 85% of buyers in the DMV start out unrealistic. So if we didn't get really, really good upfront right after we got their commitment for loyalty with expectation setting, and there's a reason that we use a data-driven process, but we do that after we get their commitment. Because I think a lot of agents go in guns blazing and their focus is on like, you know, I'm going to tell you about the market and I'm going to tell you what you can afford and all these things. And then the buyer thinks, I don't like her. She just told me I can't have what I want, right? But when you use statistics and you use those statistics to shape the buyer's understanding of the market, 
then by the time you get to the process where you're closing out the, the next steps and how you're going to proceed with the transaction, you're telling them, hey, let's go take a look at these properties. You're scheduling the next appointment to see properties that are on the market. It's pretty cool. Yep, pretty cool. Well, so here's another thing I think people should look at. Every state has different agency disclosure laws. Mm -hmm. So I tell people, use the agency disclosure laws to walk yourself into having a buyer broker agreement or a loyalty agreement signed. And yes. use that because the law mandates it. In California, we ours is uh, disclose, elect, confirm. Disclose, elect, confirm. What do you elect? There are different ways to be represented in a real estate transaction. The seller can be uh, exclusively represented. The buyer can be exclusively represented or the buyer and the seller can be represented together in dual agency. So this is mandatory disclosure that you have to make. So the problem is people typically make it way late in the relationship. You should make it sooner rather than later. So if you sit down and educate somebody, this is the way we're going to work in this way. We have three choices here in California, exclusivity on the buyer side, exclusivity on the seller side, or dual agency. I must make this disclosure. This is not a contract. This is a disclosure that I must make. And I'll tell you how I work. The way I work is I want to work for you exclusively. And the way that we do this is with this loyalty agreement or this buyer broker contract. So use the law itself the disclosure requirement to walk us right into a buyer broker contract. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's really, really smart. So are you open to changing topics dramatically? Because something happened to me in the last week, and I'm really excited about it. Yeah, let's talk about it. Okay. So first, let me just share in a place of vulnerability. Um, some of you guys think the people who have big teams, wow, They've got it all figured out. They're selling a lot of houses and, you know, they don't make the same mistakes that I do. Well, I'm going to share with you guys. I made a huge mistake in my business about a year and a half ago, year and a few months ago, I decided to change my CRM and I am not a CRM hopper. I'm the opposite. So I kept my CRM that I had previously for 10 years. And there was some functionality that no matter all of the technological band-aids I put on my CRM, it couldn't do what I wanted it to do. And the primary issue I had is that I wanted all of my agents to be able to see everything from one dashboard, okay? I wanted them to be able to figure out how to run their day by looking at it. And I couldn't integrate the MLS feed and what their clients were looking at into my old CRM. So I decided to move to follow-up boss. So here is my mistake. Obsessed with follow-up boss. I think their customer service is amazing. I think the way that they integrate technology is genius. Um, but I delegated rolling out my CRM to other people on my team. And I think delegation is incredible. I think it's very important to your success. When you think you're the only person who can do something, that often stops you from growth, right? But in this case, I delegated it and I ran away. I was like, whoo, I'm glad they're dealing with that and I don't have to. The amount of money that it has cost me by not being close, closely involved in that process, uh, I, I realized, I'm going to tell you a big one that I realized. And if any of you are struggling right now with your conversion and you're wondering, how do I increase conversion? I want you to listen to some of the things I discovered along the way. Embarrassing? Yes. Yes. Because last year we sold 665 homes. For some of you guys, you're like 665 homes. That's amazing. For me, I was really feeling sad about that. Like we went from 1100 to 665. So it was like taking us down a notch and the market changed and a lot of things changed. But ultimately, when I look at who's responsible for that decline in our production, it's me. So what are the things I need to change? Where did I lose some of, some of the systems, some of the processes, some of our conversion techniques? What changed that caused that decrease besides the market that I can own and take responsibility for? So I started digging into all of my systems and what I was doing well and what I wasn't doing well. And one of the things I discovered, this is a big one, the way I had follow-up boss set up 
if we had a live conversation with the client, we were then having a conversation and we were putting it into a smart list, but we weren't distinguishing between a lead that was uncontacted and a live conversation. And so guess what was happening? All of these people that we had these wonderful conversations with were getting lost in an ocean, uh, like lost. So we might talk to a client who says, I have a $2 million home that I want to sell in six months. And we'd go, oh, fantastic. We'll give you a call back in three months. We'll set up the blah, 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 blah. And we think, great, we're going to call them back. And poof, they disappear in the ocean of uncontacted leads that we're losing them. So what we had to do. And there were other things. Another thing I noticed, we were making calls in the olden days, January, I used to script, script 12 voicemails so that every month we would leave a different voicemail and it was really strategic and really focused on getting a response, right? And so we would call that blitz day and we would consistently do it. Well, we had an issue where we got in trouble for leaving a voicemail. Some of you guys may relate to this. And what I didn't know is that my ISAs were so afraid of getting in trouble again. Saul, so guess what they did? They and stopped they leaving voicemails. Ah. I'm like, wait, what? So I'm looking, I go, well, how do I tell if you left a voicemail? I saw the face. The face was the oh shit face, right? They're like, Nothing to see here. I'm like, wait a minute, what's going on? So I keep digging, I keep digging. They stopped leaving voicemails altogether a year and a half ago. Wow. So imagine we have this incredible ISA department, super skilled, super talented, but if they're making all these calls and they're not leaving voicemails, imagine how much that's destroying our conversion rate. They have a proven process where you've got scripts and... The main, one of these major components has been left out and you don't know it. Yeah, I discovered it. And it took, it took that long because I didn't, I didn't have the reports. What happened is I used to have really, really specific reports and I studied everything, but guess what happens when you change CRMs, every report you've relied on in your business, which for me, it was for 10 years broke at the same time. So what's my advice after discovering all of this? Well, the first thing, I should have been involved enough to spot some of those issues by saying, here's our process. How do we confirm that this process will work in the new technology? And I think that this same mistake, if you're an agent who's successful and you're looking at hiring, I'm seeing agents make the same mistake when they hire their first assistant or their first partner or buyer's agent, right? where they're, they're going, okay, there's these things I don't want to deal with. I'll have that person deal with it and I don't have to do it anymore. But the truth is some of the most important details, you need to make sure the other person has it all the way before you can truly delegate it. And in the case of the CRM, when we had Infusionsoft, which a lot of people call that Confusionsoft, I built it myself because I hired consultants and they didn't understand what I was asking or why I was thinking the way I was. And so when you think about hiring someone in your business, you have to lean in first and make sure that all of those metrics that you've been tracking, they're accomplishing the same metrics of success before you can pull away. And I teach agents that all the time when they're scaling their business. And then what did I do on the big picture? I literally ignored my own advice and cost myself so much money. So on Monday, we just relaunched our CRM. We rebuilt everything. We're building all the reports right now. I feel like I'm like, you know, in my first year in the business again, I'm so excited. I'm looking at every detail. I'm studying every voicemail. I'm wanting to know every text message we're sending. I'm really programmatically addressing the deficits that happened in our business. And I'm seeing such a dramatic increase in appointments instantly. So I wanted to bring it up today because I think there's a lot of people struggling out there and suffering and they feel like, man, I used to be more successful and now I'm not having the same traction. It might be as simple as getting back to basics. What were you doing before? That as you got more successful, you stopped doing. 
And how do you bring yourself back to an energy of excitement around those basic things? So don't, don't lose hope. Instead, focus on going back and just, just grinding out the things that got you excited that you were building to begin with. And you know what? You're, so th that's a great lesson. And it's a lesson around a huge huge part of people's business. You can learn lessons like that in little things, but you learned it on this huge part of your business, which is CRM. Oh, so right. painful. Oh, yeah. So the CRM is so critical to people. And what you told me just now is the preparation and the process, because you knew it so much better than everybody else, because you built it that it's very difficult to delegate that because the people who you would delegate it to, unless they were next to you for all the 10 of those years, they wouldn't see it exactly the same way that you saw it. And this is a giant piece. And we look at value of real estate companies. And I hear people talk about selling their practices. And, and the fact is, there's not much to sell in a real estate business at all, unless you have a CRM that's put together properly. And that's value. And so how do you build that? And do you really let that go to somebody else? And you know the best because you built it based on what worked for you. And then you yeah. brought people in and trained them. So that's a tough one. It's a tough one to learn. And, but it brings into this other point in is how valuable CRM is yeah. to your business. Well, and you know what, Saul? I just had like, when you were explaining it um, and talking, I thought, oh boy, there's another lesson there. I, when money, when you're making a lot of money, you choose to do what you like to do in business, right? Yep. So in 2021, that's when we were making the shift. And I'm like, I, we're doing so well. I'm going to keep coaching. I'm going to keep training. I'm going to keep doing the things I'm doing. I'm going to travel and speak and do all of these things. And I'm, I'm going to let somebody else do that thing that I don't want to do that happens to be the most valuable thing I could have done to contribute to my business. So I think it's being really aware and conscious of where you as an individual add the most value, hands down. I could have added more value to my business by doing that than being on a few of the stages I was on that year. And then doing a little bit of the coaching or training I was doing, that would have been where to really invest my energy, but I didn't want to see that, right? I wanted to ignore that fact and keep on moving. And had I been really tuned in and focused on what would drive the most profitability in my business, not necessarily what would be the most fun, I would have been at the forefront of those conversations and my 2022 would have been a lot different. You know, and, we, and so you just remind me again, we sometimes take for granted what other people know and understand about what we're doing in yes. our business. Right? Yes. Yes. Well, I know we're out of time, but this was, this was super fun. I'm glad that we got to connect today. And if you guys have questions for Saul or myself, you know where to find us on social media. Um, I hope you guys took a nugget or two out of that. It's great to see you again, Carrie. You too. Bye, everybody.